Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Life. Sing with us this morning. church. It is true. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to save us, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And we entered into the Easter season last week um, by celebrating the resurrection of, his, of Jesus and his victory over death. But the, but the celebration of Easter doesn't simply last one day. 
It is a season of joy that carries us many weeks all the way to Pentecost. And so today we continue to rejoice in Jesus's victory on the cross. We're also starting a new series called Overflow today, which is going to point us to the truth that we are called to give ourselves for others in the same way that Christ gave himself for us. But, but our act of giving is simply an overflow of all the things that we have already received from God, all the things that God has already blessed us with. And so we can give our time and our attention and our resources to bless those around us because Jesus has already blessed us and given himself fully for us. And so church, as we rejoice in the life and the resurrection of Jesus, our aim as his followers should be to magnify him in our lives that we can be a light to the dark world around us and point others to his overflowing sufficiency. And so today, let's continue to take joy in the resurrection and the life and in the victory of Jesus and make his name great this morning. Let's continue to worship.
And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified. Sing that again. Oh, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway. resurrecting from the dead, giving us the opportunity to, to have life with you for the rest of eternity. Father, I do pray that, that your name would be made great this morning, that we would continue to celebrate and rejoice in your victory over death. Father, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, why don't you say hello to a couple of people around you and then take a seat. Sounds good. Good morning, New Life Church. That was my line. Oh, sorry. Good morning, New Life Church. Good to see you all. Happy Easter Tide, indeed. Easter just, Tide? Yeah. Is just, that a new holiday I haven't heard of? Yeah, I just learned about it. Josie talked about it. Nick was saying that, you know, Easter's just the beginning. You know, the hype just keeps building. And, you know, like in Easter, Jesus you know, rose from the dead and he's shimmering white in his robe. And it turns out that Easter was a Tide ad all along. A Tide ad. That was Frank that was remembers cute. the that Super Bowl cute. commercial. One of you got that. Easter Tide okay. is worth it. Yeah. All right. So um, Ryan and I are just still getting used to each other up here because we don't normally stand up here together and we're still feeling out each other's sense of it humor. It only goes up from here. It, that's, that's good. That's good. It's good for all of us, right? <laughs> all right. My name is EJ. I'm Ryan. And we're glad you're here. We are here more than just for a comedy shtick. Yes, we're also here for announcements. Content. It's all about content, friends. Uh, do you have a question? Do you want to do the, like... I always have questions. Okay. I, you, you and Warren have this thing where you ask each other questions. I will and share I it with like you. I would like to be a part of it. Okay. Okay. I will share it with you. Um, the question of the day. It's a nice, easy one. Ryan, what is your favorite animal at the zoo? This is a great question because I just uh, joined the zoo. Uh, like, you know, you join the gym and get a membership. I joined the How zoo and got a family membership and took my son there. Uh, I'm going to say uh, penguins. Penguins? Peng yeah, penguins. Pe they're wow. hilarious, right? They're wearing their little tuxedo suits, but they're also super playful. They are. And they're like birds, but they, uh, but they like dive into the water for some reason. That's true. And they're not usually sleeping. Yeah. Uh, speaking of diving in, uh, we have Vacation Bible School coming up themed scuba. Nice All transition. Right? Yeah. Diving into friendship with God. This is June 17th to 20th. 
And uh, this is for age four through completing fourth grade, uh, four days, nine to 12. I don't, if, I'm a parent of kids in that age group and uh, of one, and I don't need to sell anymore. June 17th to 20th, three, four days, three hours. It's like 20 bucks for a kid or 30 bucks if you, for your family. And if you volunteer, it's half off of that. I thought it was per hour. It doesn't say that. So that's a crazy deal for, uh, for child care and child discipleship. Like that is just, I don't need to, you're going to sign up. So just go ahead and sign up if you're a parent of that. Great deal. It uh, is a great deal. Yeah. And I bet that, I mean, I went to vacation Bible school when I was a kid and I could probably still sing one of the songs. So if you want your kids singing VBS songs, no, 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 no. That was that was a pastor thing. Oh, yeah, I'm we not don't have singing. time for that. Yeah, saying, we don't. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting the look from Nick back there. All right, speaking of kids, uh, this summer, Ayla is looking for some help. And most of our, I would say, the majority of our uh, helpers in the classrooms downstairs, you all who are students, go somewhere else. You go home, you go work, you go to LT, you go travel. So we need some help, friends. Uh, we are looking for 15 or more, um, more because many hands make light work is what we say at our house, uh, to sign up to serve for one or two Sundays this summer. It is a great time. Who doesn't want to go play and read Bible stories? It's like VBS every Sunday morning. So uh, you can email Ayla, tell her that you're interested in helping out. She will tell you, teach you what to do. It's going to be amazing. Uh, you may notice this from our stage design, which cool lights, by the way, since I've been up here, those are pretty cool. But you can tell by our greenery that uh, we love church plants here. Uh, church planting <laughs> is our passion. Uh, this and guy. So, if you're like me, thank you, only going up from here. Uh, if you're like me, and before you came here, you did not know what church planting was, uh, it's where we go, we send a team of people to another campus to start a church there. And uh, I'm actually going over to uh, Kalamazoo this afternoon to go see some of the team that we sent out over there to plant a church at Western Michigan, so that's fun. That's uh, super convenient. fun. Will you bring a plant is the question. I will not bring a plant. Oh, okay. No, not for me. I would actually, the, every time we visit them, they give us their plants, oh, which is really interesting because nice, nice. I don't want them personally. But uh, <laughs> church plants, all four. And speaking of great deals, you can help fund the next church plant for only $20. That's right. $20 Sunday for church planting on April 21st. Every year we do a, a fundraising event to uh, invest in our next church plant and efforts, whether that's sending teams to go check out sites for potential church plants or investing in the actual next church plant's budget and getting them set up well for ministry uh, in the future church plant. Church planting is our passion and want to invite us every year to invest in that. So on April 21st, if you could bring a $20 bill, be ready to give a donation of $20 uh, the offering for that day will go entirely towards the church planting budget for the following church plant. So there you go. And if you don't have cash, there are other ways that we will accept your donation. Uh, that will be on the slide. All right. Next Sunday, uh, April 14th, we would like to invite you to join us in the fireside room from 11.45 to 1.15 p.m. to discuss the LGBTQ plus uh, position and how we can love our friends um, in that community at this church. So please join us. Please RSVP uh, to the email on the slide. That way we can have enough pizza for all of you. Uh, I want to point you to the seat backs, or if you're in the front row, maybe uh, next to you are connection cards. If you're new here, this is a great place for you to write down some information to get plugged in. Let us know how you might want to get connected. Or if you've been coming here and want to share ways that you might want to serve, either right now or in the summer, like EJ talked about, uh, it's a great opportunity for you to fill that out. Let us know how we can be more connected with you and you with us. Uh, and I want to let you know the plates are going to be passed, and you can put your connection cards in those, and they'll get to the place they need to go. Or uh, when you're done filling it out, you can take it to the info desk out in the lobby, and we'll gather it there. And another thing that you can put in those plates is your tithes and offerings. Right now is an opportunity that we have to give back to the Lord what so generously has given to us. Uh, you can give 
physically by putting money into the plate that's going to be passed by, or you can give online. You can also use the um, boxes in the back. Uh, the Lord has given us so much, and it is an opportunity and an act of worship to give back to him. So you have the next two minutes to discuss what your favorite animal at the zoo is and to fill out those connection cards and to put them in the offering plate. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Something we love doing here is talking about who Jesus is, what he's done, and how he's impacting our life. And the way we practice that on Sunday mornings is by a little something called a slice of life. And here to share a slice of her life, please welcome up this morning, Autumn. Hi. Good morning, New Life. All right, so I graduated from the University of Michigan last spring, and I'm now a member of a city home group here. Okay, so two summers ago, it felt as if God wanted to teach me about faith. This became really increasingly real as the summer progressed. So I want to emphasize three things. I want to emphasize where I was at, how God provided, and then how God moved beyond my wildest expectations. So where I started was being a junior at UMich with no job, no internship, and no money in my bank account. Now, this wasn't for lack of trying. I was just hitting dead end after dead end. But this is how God provided. After wrestling with God about options falling flat, I told him to do whatever he wanted to do. I was holding to his promises of provision, but I still had no ideas. So you'll probably be surprised to hear that within a few weeks, I was driving down the road to do an internship for a small church in Cape Cod. Nope, I had never been. How I found the internship is is a crazy story in itself, but God provided housing, finances, etc., all finalized just one week before I was driving down the road. Wow, well, this wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I was just trying to apply for jobs to pay the bills that summer. So now I was going to Cape Cod to do things for Jesus. This was a little unexpected. Um, So the provisions in and of themselves were a miracle, but they don't compare to what God did over this summer. After this already unexpected twist, I decided to start my internship in a way that I do not typically do things, with no expectations. I wanted to leave room for God to do what he wanted to do. The pastor I worked under wanted to reach young adults. His idea was to throw an outreach event or two, and I could spend my internship organizing a church-wide outreach to draw young people in. What was crazy is after only about three days, I felt God telling me to also start a young adults group. That week, on the beach. Now, that doesn't sound too crazy, right? Well, there were no young adults. (laughs) I mean, me and the other intern probably brought the average church age down by a decade. 
<laughs> but beyond absolutely all logic, I set a date and time for us to start for a few days later, not knowing who could possibly show up. Now, watch and see some things God did. The day before the study, I met a girl in the gym, and we decided to be gym buddies. She had just moved to the area. I texted her about the study, and I later found out that when she received my text, she cried because that morning she had asked God for Christian friends and had never had a prayer answered so immediately before. Another time, <laughs> before the first study happened, a guy walked up to me at an event and said, do you know anything about a young adults group? I hear closely from God, and I knew nothing about this event, but I knew I needed to come here and ask you about a young adult group. You can imagine how my jaw dropped as I replied, uh, I'm starting one this Thursday. <laughs> um, he later became a leader of the group. Um, the stories go on, but the astonishing part was that I happened to do no specific advertisement for the group, and the young person population on Cape Cod is almost non-existent. It's difficult enough to do this on a college campus filled with young people. It was so clear it was God pulling everything together with his hands, not Autumn's. And I was in awe. When we showed up to the first meeting, there were eight of us total, and over 20 people came over the course of the seven weeks we met. God even raised three of these people to lead moving forward. Within seven short weeks, people experienced Christian community for the first time. Others learned to evangelize. Others learned how to lead studies. Another heard God speak for the first time. Some felt encouraged to start other Christian-related groups. The church itself was encouraged by the stories, and lifelong friendships were formed. I was shocked that it felt as if I was just living and breathing and going about my life, and God was just doing things. And it not only changed my life, but it changed others. So this is the story of how God took my broken, confused college student self, tossed my ideas out the window, and took me on an adventure with him. I learned that it's okay for even each day to be unexpected. <laughs> I will no longer present God with my options one, two, or three that I can see when God can see option 10,538. Our God is faithful. Our God provides for his children. Our God says his thoughts are higher than ours, that we don't need to worry about tomorrow and simply follow me, which to me sounds like an invitation for the greatest adventure we could hope for, all backed by the promise of his love. I'm Autumn, and this was a slice of my life. Would you all join me in praying for Autumn? Lord, thanks for this testimony of uh, what can happen when we live our lives wholly submitted to you. Lord, thanks for uh, the courage she had to submit her future to you um, and how you were to take that offering and make so much of it, um, so much more than she could have imagined. Um, Lord, thanks for moving and drawing people to come to know you. Thanks for leading your people and inviting us into an adventure of following you. Lord, pray for Autumn that she would continue to live her life this way as an example to people around her. Uh, Lord, may we be people uh, in this congregation, so many uh, who care so much about our vocation and our future, that would even submit that very precious thing to you and see what you might do with that. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Autumn. Give it up for Autumn one more time. I'll take that. All right. Uh, you know, as God's people, we are no strangers to uh, nuance and confusion. And you might be like, what does he mean by that? Uh, you know, we've got, uh, we've got uh, John the Baptist and John the Apostle, and that can be confusing. And that you don't want which one's which. You've got Elijah and Elijah. They sound very familiar. Could easily get them confused. So you might be familiar with our overflow service as a church, which is a way we celebrate God's overflowing uh, blessing and generosity to us each year and that's going to be happening on April 28th but right now we're starting our overflow sermon series that is going to lead up to is four-part series leading up to and culminating in our overflow service and so here to kick off that service is not the uh, prophet Joel but pastor Joel please welcome up Joel <laughs> I feel like the prophet Joel would be really old by now. <laughs> good morning, everybody. So good to be with you. You doing good? Did you see the sunshine? Yeah. It's happening, people. Spring for a little while. I mean, you never know how long. It's Michigan. We usually get snow at some point in April. So just buckle up. It could, it could happen still. 
Um, if you're new with us, we're just so thrilled to have you. It's just, it's just a privilege to be together with you in a worship together. So we are starting this new series today. Thanks for shaving off like seven minutes of my talk, Ryan. That was good. Um, I, love, I, love this, I love this series because this idea of, of overflowing God, it's, it's, it's from his very nature of who he is. That's who he is. At, at New Life, we say generosity is our joy, and it's one of our values because that's part of what happens when you have an overflowing God. He overflows into us, and that joy comes from us into others. And so this series is based on four passages where generosity and blessing overflow. In the kingdom of God, the gifts of God are for us, but they're never meant to stop with us. So time, money, people, possessions, they continue to flow from one hand to another, one church to another, so that the, the grace of God extends to more and more people, and his name is glorified. We are meant to be a blessing to others. We're blessed to be a blessing. So how do we live open-handed? How do we live like that? This church community is especially... Um, unique in, in its transitional nature. Most of you have experienced that. We have a lot of uh, graduate activity happening around here with school and moving out and people getting jobs and transitioning. And so this is a particularly um, in and out intensive rhythm in the community. And that can be awesome and it can be difficult at the same time because you make friends and then they move and there's all that. But, but there's this, this sense, this constant sense of we're a church that is, that is sending people out into the world. And we love that. Um, we do have that awesome service at the end of April, and I would encourage you to come just as we get a chance to celebrate all the things that God has done this year. And uh, it's the same, same day we're actually going to do our graduate send-off that day, too. So it'll be a fun one. Please come to that one. Overflow reminds me of this moment about 20 years ago. I asked my son for permission to show this. This is, this is him um, at the water park. And this water park had, like... Um, all the water park stuff, right? Like the wave pool and the zero depth entry and the things that come out of the ground and the slides and that castle thing that has water and the kids are like shooting guns at you just when you get close and zipping down the slides and all that. But he's like not interested in any of those things. He just wanted to play with this one little thing that's like off the splash pad. It was like water would come up the central tube and then it would pour out into these like channels that he could like move and shift around. He could control the flow of all of it and he could put little objects that would slide in there and it would change the shape of the water and you just would love it. And these other kids would come up and they'd, they'd, they'd look at it for like 20 or 30 seconds and then they're looking up at the big other things and they're like, yeah, this isn't cool, I'm out. But he would just sit there for hours with this smile on his face the whole time. And of course, I'm his father um, and so I also would sit there for hours because you can't leave a two-year-old by themselves. The water park, not recommended, don't do it, unless it's VBS and then you can leave them. <laughs> So I would just sit there and I would just soak up the joy, right? To see him playing and, and loving the moment and just soaking up the joy. So with that image in mind, let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our time this morning. Holy Father, you are good. You know what you intend for this morning. And I pray that your words, your truth would come shining forth. We would get a chance to know you better, know your word better. That there would be things in our life that you do and change as a result of the time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so overflow. You know what's not overflowing? My kitchen sink. Here's evidence. We live, we live out in the country, so we have a well pump, and I've checked that. In fact, I've checked everything that I can conceivably think of to check in the house. But there's some mysterious and inconsistent blockage that results on our sink doing this on occasion, which is not cool for dishes and other things like that, right? Something's wrong, would you agree? Something's not as it should be. And this too makes me think of our world. We have a God who overflows with love, and if you think of the people in the world as fixtures in the house, sometimes the fixtures offer barely a trickle or nothing at all. And I can't help but notice the contrast of this, this image with what we see in the Bible. All throughout the Bible, we see imagery of a river that flows with life, pure, clean, powerful, from the Garden of Eden, the start of Psalms, all the way to the very end of Revelations. In fact, we'll go there in that, that verse. This is Revelations 22.1. This is an angel is pulling John, not John the Baptist, as Ron was saying, a different John, aside and telling him how it's going to be at the end when Jesus overcomes all things. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
a river flowing with life. Now contrast that to this image. What, what is this image here? What you got? What do we got? Stagnant pond. Good adjective. Stagnant. This is what water looks like when it stops flowing for a long time, right? The water is no longer clean and pure. I wouldn't recommend drinking it. Filled with dangerous bacteria, right? Uh, when, when the flow stops, so does life. Blood, too, is like this. If you think about it, when it's moving and on the inside of your body, you're generally good. When it's not, and it's on the outside, and it stops moving, something is wrong. Let's go ahead. We'll do a test real quick. Just, no. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Not intentionally, anyway. The day is young. Who knows? Um, okay, let's jump into our scene. John 3. Um, th- let me give you some context on this. Oh, by the way, you can follow along on, on the screen, or you can read in your phone or whatever electronic device you have that flashes the scriptures there. And we have paper Bibles that we give away for free all the time at the Info Center. You can grab one for a friend or yourself anytime you want, as long as we still have them, which hopefully is always. Two main characters in the story, Jesus and John the Baptist. And John was set apart before he was even born to serve as a prophet for God to pave the way for the coming Messiah. Plot spoiler, that's Jesus. And so he's been doing that. He lived in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey. He was dressed in camel's hair. He preached about the coming Messiah. He preached a message of repentance, baptized with water. Eventually, Jesus' ministry started up. And one day, Jesus visits John. And John identifies Jesus as the Messiah and baptizes him in the river, incidentally. And then the voice of God sounds from heaven, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And Jesus goes on to do his ministry and John continues his, but some of John's audience become upset and that's the context for our our verses to start today. They came to John and they said, Rabbi, That man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater I must become less. Let me tell you more about John. He's kind of a big deal. Not because of how he dressed or where he lived, but because of the role that he played and the character with which he played it. Jesus himself, elsewhere in the Gospels, says of John, he says, Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not yet arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. He's a pretty impressive dude. Also, for generation after generation, God had been speaking to his people through prophets. All throughout the Old Testament, he'd send prophets, and the prophets would, would speak to the people from God, and God would speak to the prophets, and they would speak to the people, and people would seek the prophets out on things, and that whole interchange was happening all the time until all of a sudden it wasn't. We call it the intertestamental period. It's the last part sandwiched between the Old Testament and the New Testament, a time of 400 years of silence when God didn't send any prophets. But all of a sudden, he did. And this reminds me of a Taylor Swift song. (laughs) Love story. I just can't get out of my head the last couple weeks. There's a part of the song that's sort of like this time in history, right? Juliet is pretty sure that Romeo loves her, but the relationship's been complicated, and she hasn't heard from him in a while. Um, Any Taylor Swift fans out there? Oh, Oh, you, miss, can I borrow you? Oh, yeah. Oh, you look nice today. Okay, just, just in case you've never heard the song before, we're going to attempt to sing it. We're not professionals. Well, she's more professional than me. I'm scared half to death. Oh, that's okay. It's how it's supposed to be on stage. Heart's pumping. It's all good for singing. All right, ready? Here we go. Okay. I got tired of waiting, wondering if you were ever coming around. My faith in you was fading when I met you on the outskirts of town. And I said, Romeo, save me. I've been feeling so alone. I keep waiting. 
for you but you never come is this in my head i don't know what to think he knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring and said marry me juliet you'll never have to be alone i love you and that's all i really know i talk to your dad go pick out a white dress it's a love story baby just say yes Yeah. Well done. Taylor Swift, John's arrival on the scene is like the moment when Romeo, he kneels down, right? Kneels down. What happens when someone kneels down? Pay attention, something important is about to happen, right? Okay, so that's John the Baptist. And behind the scenes, God has been preparing for this moment for a long time. He's not, he's silent, but he's not been inactive. He's, in fact, been planning this for a really, really long time. And Jesus' arrival on the scene is the beginning of the proposal. Guess what? God loves us. He loves us. We can stop wondering. We are deeply loved and precious to God. Now all that's left is to say yes. But John's disciples aren't seeing the moment. Maybe it's because Taylor Swift hadn't been born yet. I don't know. They're viewing the moment from a human lens. And to be honest, that's our problem too. Here's how they see it. Dude, you remember that guy from last week? He's stealing your peeps, man. Not the Easter candy, the people. You gotta protect your assets, man. You gotta do something. You're gonna lose everything that you've built up. But I want two things to really pop in your mind about John's response. A person can only receive what is given them from heaven. That's the first thing. It's more closely at that. Only receive what's given them from heaven. In other words, there's a flow. There's a direction. And what we receive comes to us from an overflowing God, the source of love, provision, safety, purpose, value, forgiveness. All of that comes from God who's overflowing. It's actually the core mechanic of God's plan to bless the world, all of his creation. His love flows out from him to some, from them to others, from them to others, from them to others. And we know this from what we see in the Bible. Call it Operation Overflow, if you will. I've never seen that in any of this, the text or the commentaries, but maybe someone will write it now. I don't know. It's how he's getting his love, his care, his compassion, his glory, his name out to a world that needs it. And the relationship started with Adam and Eve, but then it broke quickly. But God was in love with his creation. He wasn't done just because of the sin that they committed and that we've now inherited God was still deeply invested in that relationship with his creation, that love relationship. So Operation Overflow, here's how it works. God chose Abraham and promised to bless him and then sealed that promise with a covenant. And through Abraham, God would birth the nation of Israel and they would be a kingdom of priests. They would spread his glory, his name, his fame throughout the entire world. God's overflowing nature to the rest of the earth through them. The heart of the plan is formed through the heart of God, the very nature of who he is, a God who is overflowing, who is generous. His love flows out. His passion flows out. In New Life, we talk about living scent. And this is what we mean, that the God who loves us flows all that into us. We experience it, receive it, and then pass it on to others. We live scent. We're sending the love and the goodness that God gives us constantly to others. We are loved by God, and we go out and love others because he first loved us. But really, all this overflowing love starts in the Trinity, what we talk about God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one. Not my topic for today, but it starts there. So a person can only receive what is given them from heaven because that's the very nature of who God is, both in power and goodness. He's the creator. Everything flows from him, starts from him. Second idea, he must become greater. I must become less. This stands in hard contrast to the way things work in our world, right? We're supposed to become greater. That's the point. We get bigger, we get smarter, we get more money, more skill, greater fame, greater accomplishments, greater audience, greater legacy. Think about the things that are valuable and good according to our world, our culture. And John's followers are concerned about those things too, on his behalf. But he says to them, Jesus must become greater. It's not about me. It's never really been about me. My whole purpose is about him. In 
And interestingly enough, fulfilling that purpose, far from costing John something, actually brings him true joy, complete joy. Love joy. I want more joy. I want more joy for you. There's something to have here. Now, let me nuance this a bit. There's nothing wrong with John gathering around him a good, sizable crowd. In fact, that was the point. He was supposed to do that. He did his job well. He's simply being faithful to his work. But he understood his purpose in the grand scheme of things. At a point in time, when the time came for Jesus to arrive on the scene, it was time for John's crowd to move from him to Jesus. His disciples didn't get that, but John understood that. Are you in the late stages of a task God has given you? If so, it might be time or maybe past time to hand that off to the next person that God has in mind to take it. Kind of a side note, but it's a note nonetheless. We know that the constant pursuit of greater is a race that we can never win and one that we're probably actually not supposed to run in the first place. We know this truth, but it's still hard to accept it. We know that more whatever will not bring that satisfaction that we really want because all that happens when we get more is we immediately want to protect it. We want to keep it. And so we're living in one or two ways for the most part. Even when we don't have something, we're trying to go get it. We're in the pursuit of getting it. And when we have it, we're trying to protect it. And we're still trying to get more. And John gives a big, fat <laughs> thumbs down to all that. He says, it's not the way I want you to live. And it's not the way God wants us to live. Because this is the antithesis of Project Overflow. It's not about getting and keeping. It's about receiving and giving. That's where the joy is found. And that's what will bless those around us. There is a river of life, a flowing stream, not a stagnant pond. Think about it in terms of our body. There is a constant flow of blood that moves essential ingredients around, all the parts, right? And if one of the parts, let's say like this part of my thumb here, just decided to collect all the blood, all the nutrients, all the life from the rest of my body, my body would die. It would be gross. And this would die too. Recognize I'm saying all this out loud about the blood, but also about the fact that these things are hard. In real life, they're hard. It's a day-to-day -day battle. And I want to hold on to the things that come to me because I want to build up my own sense of security and my own sense of well-being. Because there's this little driving force, this little voice in my head that says, the more I have, the more secure I'll be. It's the same for you too, right? When we give into that voice, we end up with death instead of life, a stagnant pond instead of a river flowing with life. The Gospel of Luke says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. This is the mystery. This is how God set it up. The river that flows is life, but the stagnant pond that no longer flows is filled with death. This is the reversal that God gives us. There's blessing in the giving. We can see this in the rest of the passage, and we're going to go there in just a little bit. Um, in fact, we'll go there now. Okay. Look at the Trinity. Pay attention to God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. What are they doing? What are they each doing in these verses? John 3, 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all, and he testifies to what he has seen and heard. But no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful, for the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. And the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. God gives the Spirit without limit. And the Father has placed everything in the Son's hands, in Jesus' hands. And Jesus gives out life to everyone who believes in him. God is overflowing. What about the wrath of God John talks about? Well, yes, it's real. But only for those who reject Jesus. Because God's love is for everyone. He wants everyone to have it, but he doesn't force us to accept it. Those who do not accept it effectively block the only source of goodness and love that they're ever going to find in the world. And thus they end up with judgment and wrath instead because when all good is removed, what else is left? Remember Easter last week? The wrath of God poured on Jesus at the cross. He took it upon himself, restoring a relationship with us and God. He must become greater. We must become less. But the beautiful mystery of that is that when we live like that, 
We might have less things, but we get more joy. Not to change the topic, but I am going to. I still have this water problem at the house, okay? It's inconsistent. I really have looked into it, I mean, extensively. I'm, I'm not inexperienced with regard to these things, okay? I've had professionals out to the house, and they're like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Um, I'm glad I don't live here. And then they just walk out the door. <laughs> the second guy charged me and then walked out the door. Oh, that was a hard check to write based on my personality. So we're exploring all these things, but I, I know that the source is good. Here's another picture. I took this. There's this, this, is, this is the water pressure off of the well pump. It's pretty good, right? Those look, it looks different. Like you wouldn't want to get that in the face, but the other one, you would be fine, right? There's not a problem with the source. The source is all good. I just can't figure out what it is yet. Getting closer. I have the same problem in my life as I do in my house, except in my life, I'm a little closer to the answer, I think, um, at least a few of them. It kind of changes on a day-to-day -day basis. But in my life, two culprits are kind of high on the list, pride and self-reliance. God made me and you in his image, which means that our best life is found by being like him. That's the master plan. But that comes through humility and yieldedness. But if I believe that my well-being my identity, my worth depends on me, that I need to be my own security. I need to gather everything that I can to protect myself. I can't let it flow out because fear keeps it in. If I let it go, I will no longer have enough. That's what the fear says. But this is where faith comes in. If I trust in the nature of God, the goodness of God, he's a God who is constantly overflowing good things to me. Whenever I give something out, he will put it right back. Whatever needs to be there, he will give it. And that requires trust. And when I want to hold on to those things, what I'm experiencing instead of life is actually death. Like a stagnant pond, right? Whose water may actually kill someone who drinks it. What's coming out of me when I'm a stagnant pond? In New Life, we see generosity is our joy. But if we're honest, sometimes it's our fear. I got a call from a number I didn't recognize um, about a year ago or some, some change. Then I listened to the voicemail. And it turns out it was a call from a friend. He, um, he had uh, gone to the ER, uh, got a neighbor to take him to the ER because he was in a medical situation and needed it. And then they redirected him from the ER to the psych ER and then from the psych ER to another hospital against his will. So he's now in a psychiatric inpatient care in another hospital. And that's when I got this call. He was the I was the first person he called. And I, I had a moment, right? I'm listening to the voicemail and it was a kind of a deep sigh moment of like, am I really picking up the phone to make this call? Because this is gonna be complicated. This is going to take some time. If I really step into this situation, this is going to cost me. And you know what? It did. <laughs> it did. It was difficult. It was complicated. It was hard. And that little voice inside of me was saying, you got to protect your time. you got to protect your assets. But then God was reminding me, no, I put this person in your life for a reason. And so I stepped into that space, and you should have seen the joy on his face like three months later when I drove to the hospital and picked him up and brought, brought his dog along with him, and he was just overjoyed. He was just so happy to be free, to be out, to, to engage his life. And it was such a satisfying moment then. I don't think that was all for that, but God's doing something. He works through us, intending to bless other people who are in real legitimate need, and he actually makes that to our benefit at the same time, even though it seems difficult, even though it seems hard. How about you? How's Operation Overflow going for you and your life? Are there restrictions in place somewhere in your heart? Where is that flow restricted in your life? You might have an immediate answer that pops in your brain. Yes, I really struggle with letting go of money or, or time, like me or I have a hard time blessing or cheering on other people because I really just want the praise for myself. Maybe it's forgiveness. God's forgiven you, but you have a hard time giving that forgiveness out to others. What is it for you? If you're having a hard time coming up with it, I think look at what stresses you out. What are you, what are you struggling with? What do you, what's taking the, the most of your brain space? That's a good indication of the thing that you cannot let go. 
These are places that are most at risk of being stagnant or dead within us. And they're not the same every single day, but probably over the course of life, there's some consistencies, some themes. And when we live like that, we think that the best we can do is to hold on to the scraps of life that are coming our way. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. I'll take that, I'll take all that. But life and joy are found in the overflow. When we become more like our good God, The good news of Jesus is is beautiful, but it's hard. It's a hard truth. It's free. We cannot pay for it. We haven't earned it, but it's still hard to accept because it comes along with these guidance, these words, right? And Luke, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. It's hard. But if we come to trust in the nature of a God who is constantly overflowing, always overflowing, Whenever we flow out, he will flow into us. It won't always be exactly what we want and exactly the ways we want, but it will be enough. In fact, it will be more than enough because he is a good father and he wants to experience his kids to experience good things, and he is limitless. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he can't give that is good. So our lives are like that moment with my two-year-old son 20 years ago, right? with the flowy river watery thingy. That constant, strong source of water is always flowing up to the ground until they shut it off. But during the day, it's always flowing up. And and he can manipulate the flow of water. He has actual control over that flow, just like we do. He can restrict it. He can change it. He can move it. And how we engage that activity has everything to do with what we think about our God. So let's find that thing. Let's find those restrictions. Let's, let's not rest until we get that water flowing out of the sink again. Figure out what those things are and lean into them because there's more joy that God has for you when we press into that space. And I know I want that joy for you. God wants it much more than I do. And he alone is able to give it. Let's pray. Holy Father, would you show us those things, but also grant us the strength to trust you more. You are gracious to us, Lord. You don't just tell us to trust you. You demonstrate your trustworthiness. You do it through the scriptures. You do it through stories. You do it through our own life. I just, even thinking about Autumn's story, just clear evidence that you hear us, you see us, you answer our prayers, you move, you are working. And I thank you for that. I pray for your power, God, to do the work that only you can do in us and through us. In your name we pray, amen. So throughout this year, we've been cultivating uh, a habit of spending some time in silence in our services, which is weird when you're in a room of a couple hundred people, but we're doing it anyway. And to, to, to listen to God, to develop the habit of listening to God, because that's one of the best, most important things that we can do as followers of Jesus. Hear his voice, listen to him. And obey him. And so here's how it works. We read this verse. It's, it's kind of the capstone verse for our discipleship pathway, which was all the last series. You can go back if you want and catch that uh, on YouTube. And, um, but in this time, we'll just spend some time listening to God. And we're focused this week on the worship habits. And so the heart of it was just asking God, is there something you want me to see and hear here in these moments? And if you, if you bring something to mind that's completely different than those things, grab onto that too, because he's God. He knows what he's doing. So read this with me if you wouldn't. Yeah, thanks, Max. We'll go back to that. Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So let's just take a moment of silence before the Lord to listen. Max, can you bring up that next one again? Thanks.
Thank you for doing that together with us. If God spoke to you, great. That's a great thing. That's a great voice to listen to. If not, that's okay. Because there was a period of time when he didn't speak to a lot of people for 400 years. So a couple minutes, not that bad. We trust in a God who's good. His timing is good. His words are good. This is the time in our service where we're celebrating communion. We do this because we're moving back a couple thousand years to that moment Jesus was with his disciples before he went to the cross. And he told them about what was coming uh, to pass. And, uh, and he said, remember this. Remember what I do for you. Remember that my body was broken for you. My blood was poured out for you because our relationship with him has been restored. I was driving in this morning and reading um, Leviticus and Numbers, which is... <laughs> Not my favorite part of the scriptures. Um, but it's important. It identifies the justice of God. And I was just feeling the heaviness of the justice of God. But then coming in this morning and just being reminded of the fact that he is a loving father. He loves us. He wants good things for us. Yes, he's just. That's a good thing about him. But he's made a way for us to be reconciled to him. And so because he is the source of everything that is good and all that is flowing out of him, I'd encourage you in this time to spend some time looking at him. Turn your face to him. Receive from him anything that he wants to give you in this time. If there's something in your heart you want prayer for, we'll have prayer ministers at the front uh, and the back and the balcony too, I think. And then this is an opportunity for us to be united in the fact that God didn't just do this for you, although he would have, but he did it for all of us. To draw us into a community that can love him and love one another. Just stand if you're able as we worship.
that's never failing let mercy fall on me oh, everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a Savior Every Sunday is ascending Sunday because Jesus never stops overflowing goodness to us and he wants you to send it out into the world. He made you special. The people that you can touch, the lives that you can make a difference in, the spaces where you're needed, you're needed. And God is sending you, and not because you're perfect, but because he is. So let's go today. Let's enjoy that sunshine and enjoy the blessings of God as we go out. It's not an easy life, but he is with us. Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. We love you. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.